You can write everything down if you want to. Be brave enough to write every one of your goals down. But I'm going to tell you something. Life's going to hit you in your mouth and you got to do me a huge favor. Your why has to be greater than that knockdown. And I love it. Buster Douglas got knocked out. Nobody ever got knocked out by Mike Tyson and ever got back up. It was almost a 10 count. I, he was stumbling. They were four, three, two, he, one. And ding, ding, ding. Saved by the bell. He goes to his corner. The whole world is like, up. Oh, that's it. Once he comes back out, that's it. Mike's going to just hammer him. And exactly that. Mike Tyson came out like, I got him. I got this kid up against the rope. Listen to me, many of you right now, life's got you up against the rope. You can't give up. You can't give in. Listen to me, if it was easy, everybody would do it. And if life's got you backed up, I need you to do what Buster Douglas did. Buster Douglas started fighting back. And the world was shocked. <gasps> Goliath has been knocked down. What happened? And they went to Buster Douglas and they asked Buster Douglas simply like, what happened? And Buster Douglas said, listen to me, it's real simple. Before my mother died, she told the whole world that I was going to beat Mike Tyson. And two days before the fight, my mother died. Buster Douglas had, he had a decision to make. When his mother died, he could die with his mother. Or he made a decision, I can wake up and I can live for mom. And he knocked Mike Tyson out simply because his why was greater than that punch. His why was greater than defeat. His why was greater than his trial and his tribulation. And I'm telling you, if you don't know what your why is and your why isn't strong, you're going to get knocked out every single day. versus with your family. My, my, my. I don't know about you, but have you ever felt like you were on the ropes? You ever felt like you took some punches? Didn't know if you were going to make it back? You ever felt like your relationship got hit in the mouth? Mm. I know you can't say man because you're married to a person that you're sitting next to or engaged, or hoping to go out on a date. <laughs> You're like, man, if I say amen, they may have questions at lunch I don't want to answer. This could get uncomfortable quick. Well, if you have your Bibles, go to the book of Psalm, chapter 128. It's our touchstone passage for this series. I want to encourage you to memorize. It's only six verses. And so, I encourage you to memorize these six verses. But this morning, I'm going to talk to you about how to get up and how to find yourself when you're against the ropes to get back into the middle of the ring. Because if you live life long enough, you're going to find yourself backed up against the ropes, backed up against a wall, backed into a corner. You're going to find yourself in situations in your marriage, in your family, in your life, it wasn't what you thought it was going to be. Because though marriage was created in heaven, so was thunder and lightning. <laughs> You've heard me say it before. Marriage isn't always kissy poo. Sometimes it's just poo. And you find yourself against the ropes. And what I want to do is give you some practicals and help you get back into the fight in the middle of the ring and cause your relationship, your marriage to be everything God wants it to be. And you may be here this morning. You're like, Pastor Son, I'm not married. Let me help you. The best time to learn how to fly a helicopter is not when it's about to fall out of the sky and crash. It's 
when it's on the ground. You say, what does that have to do with anything? The best time to learn about marriage is before you're married. Not when you're in the middle of it. Now, this is what I know. When you're not married and you're dating, you're like, But when you get married, you're like, <laughs> and you didn't listen because you had stars in your eyes. So I, I want you to not get the stars in your eyes because I want to give you some practicals today that I hope truly, truly help you. All right? And so Psalm 128, I'm going to read all six verses. If you're there, say amen. If you gave up, look up. We'll help you. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. This is his idea of family. This is his idea of relationship. This is his idea of marriage. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. And may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Father, we thank you for a right now word at the right now time. God, somebody walked in this building today right on time, and you have a word for them. God, help me to do my part because I know you're going to do yours. In Jesus' name, let everybody say amen. And amen. You can be seated. It is good to be home. Uh, we are glad to be back. And be honest, when I got off the plane, I walked right over to the desk at United and said, I need a flight back to Iceland. This heat is ridiculous. John has said, You can't go. I'll tell you more about my trip later. I will tell you this. In the nation of Iceland, there's only 10 Assembly of God churches with only eight pastors. The culture as a people is a disaster, a wreck. They need Jesus desperately, but they need the love of God because they had religion forced down their throat, and they have rejected it. Sweetest people you'll ever meet, but don't know the Lord. Their family construct is, is as con convoluted as anything I've ever seen in my life. It's a hot mess. We'll talk about it later. Matter of fact, I was talking to some guys. I said, you know, my oldest son loves Iceland so much. And they're like, well, maybe God wants him to be a missionary there. We'll support him. And I'm like, I'm looking at the guys I'm talking to. I'm talking to 24 of the most influential pastors in the United States of America. And all of them were like, something needs to be done in Iceland. Raise him up, and we'll support it, make it happen. I was like, mm, I don't know if Trey would like to be a missionary. <laughs> Man, last week, Keith kicked it off. Didn't he do a great job? My word. Wow. Dang, I didn't even want to come home and have to follow that. I was like, Man, that ain't fair. When, when, when I think about the fear of the Lord, the whole 128 of Psalms, the first verse, talks about the, the fear of the Lord. When you have a biblical worldview and realize God is the one who created all of this. I, I've been amazed. I've been just, man, addicted to the images that are coming back from the James Webb Telescope. 
They launched it Christmas Day of 2021. And the James Webb Telescope, they sent it out in space. They sent it a million miles out. And then it unfolded, and it's the size of two football fields. It is so powerful that it is sending us infrared images 14 billion light years away, and it's sending it back to Houston, Texas at NASA. And we're getting these images of universes, of supernovas, uh, of galaxies. That's a galaxy. And here's what it's doing to the astrophysicists and to the scientists. And i, I got to be real honest with you. There's a part of me that is just loving this. I'm, I'm a little sadistic. Y'all pray for me. But if the Big Bang Theory is correct, then when it went boom, light, energy, Dark matter, mass, infrared should diminish the further it gets away from the center boom. But from 14 billion light years away, it's getting brighter. It's not diminishing. And the scientists are coming back and saying, our theory is wrong. But if you have a biblical worldview, when God says, let there be light, it doesn't diminish until he says, light, stop. Instead, it goes forth and continues to get brighter and brighter and brighter. No wonder David would write in the Psalms that he was fearfully and wonderfully Mate, Neil deGrasse Tyson, an astrophysicist, which I really like the guy. He's an atheist. He doesn't believe in God, which the Bible would call him a fool. You can be a smart fool. I've met some. He says the probability of you and I, the human race, existing is 10 to the 29th power. But then he goes down and he says it's 1 in 10 to the 29th power. That's the number right there. It's a amazing loom. <laughs> so the chances, according to the boom, of everything lining up and you being here, those are your odds. And you want to think, I got faith? Man, if you believe that, you got more faith than I could ever. It is said that the probabilities of this happening is you have a better chance, listen to this, of winning the lottery, being struck by lightning, and winning another lottery in the same day. And those odds are half of that. And they say that baby you have in your arms, that was the probability of her coming into this life. But David said, no, I was fearfully and I was wonderfully made I was fashioned together in my mother's womb. I wasn't playing the odds. I was designed on purpose, for purpose. You say, Pastor John, what does that have to do with family fight? I, I want you to view family. I want you to view marriage from a biblical perspective, not from a popular, psychological, physiological, sociological perspective. 
marriage will work if we do it God's way. If we don't, you're playing the odds. I'd rather choose God's way. If I'm going to do life, let's talk about picking someone you're going to do life with. I want to do life with someone who sees God as I do. When, when I got ready to date Jonna, and I, I just kind of, I made it a matter of prayer. I mean, she was gorgeous. She was fine. But can I be honest with you? Beauty is skin deep, ugly is to the bone. And God don't like ugly. And so I wanted someone who viewed God the way I viewed God. I didn't do no missionary dating. I went him to Jesus. He's just so. <laughs> I wanted to do life with someone who understood the kingdom of God the way I understood the kingdom of God that in the kingdom of God it's we have purpose we have meaning we have significance when it's not bumping through life as a matter of blob someone who feared God and desired to walk in the ways of God See, what I believe is most of life's problems can be traced directly back to the breakdown of the family and the destruction of the family. I was playing golf at a golf course called Castle. It's one of the, the multiple golf courses there at St. Andrews. And my caddy, he's 28 years old, and we're having a conversation and he found out, he asked me, he said, do you have a family? I said, man, yeah, I'm married and I have two great boys and I've got two incredible granddaughters and I'm going to be home on Friday and have a grandson. You knew this service wasn't going to get by without me mentioning the very picture of perfection, which is Callan Gray Gibson. Somebody came into my office, I think it was poor Leslie, and she said, he's just perfect. I said, well, what would you expect? Anyway, and so I start telling that. And so the, this young man, 28 years old, he said, can I ask you a question? He doesn't know I'm a pastor yet. We're going to get to that part. And he said, why, why is there such a deterioration of the family? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, marriage in Europe is archaic. People aren't getting married like they used to. The family is falling apart. Why? I said, you really want to know the answer? And he said, yeah. So I just, we had a great conversation for about eight holes. We get to hole number nine. He said, can I ask you another question? I said, sure. He said, What's, there's something different about you and the three guys you're playing with. I said, what do you mean? He said, I caddy on this course every day. And I hear more foul language from people who are hitting shots. And y'all hadn't cussed once. And y'all have hit some shots that were curse worthy. <laughs> and I wish I had a Scottish accent because it's awesome in Scottish. And I said, well, I said, man, when it comes down to it, all four of us just love Jesus. And when you really love Jesus, you try not to let that kind of language come out of your mouth. You want to speak things that are wholesome and good. He said, oh, y'all are religious. I said, oh, no, not at all. I said, I said, we love Jesus. So there's major difference. So for the next nine holes... We had a conversation about faith. We got to number 18. I just told her, I said, man, I wish you had my faith. I said, if you had my faith, you wouldn't give up on family. If you had my faith, you wouldn't give up on marriage. If you had my faith, you wouldn't give up on God. I said, matter of fact, buddy, if you had my faith, 
you wouldn't give up on yourself. He said, well, how do I have your faith? I said, well, it's really interesting. It's free. I said, religion makes you pay for faith, but God gives you faith. I said, so all you have to do is ask. And he did what Americans do. He said, it cannot be that easy. I said, oh, it is. So we're walking up hole 18, which I proceeded to triple bogey. But that's okay. I was talking to him about faith. But I found it interesting that people around the world are asking all kinds of questions. They're asking the right questions. And the church better have an answer. Because the world doesn't need religion. The world needs Jesus. The world doesn't need dogma. The world needs faith. But it needs somebody that's living it to model it so that they're inquisitive about it. I'll tell you another thing that was interesting, and this is free. I, 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 I'm not going to get into this today because I'm going I'm to share a lot about my trip in the days ahead because I, I learned so much. It, it was just amazing. But everywhere I went, it didn't matter if it was Iceland, Svalbard, Norway, Finland, Scotland, when they found out we were from the U.S., every last one of them would say, what is wrong with y'all? <laughs> no kidding. They asked, what has happened to the United States of America? What's going on with y'all? Which I had great conversations about that too. <laughs> and brought them faith, not politics faith. See, I think we all view marriage from a fallen paradigm instead of a kingdom paradigm. But I'm going to be honest with you. We build marriages from a Genesis 3 perspective instead of a Genesis 2 perspective. You got no idea. He's like, Dad, I like music. I'm like, what do you know about music? He said, well, I play the guitar and sing. I said, you're 11. <laughs> he grabs my Takamini guitar, $2,500 guitar, starts playing it, singing a song he wrote that's better and plays it better at 11 than I had ever played it, and I had been leading worship with it for three years. And I realized that day, okay, his bent is not athletics. His bent is creativity. And I said, son, if you'll just finish the season and finish what you started. <laughs> I'll never ask you to play baseball again, and I'll give you my guitar. Because, baby, you play it better than I do. On that day, I had to make a decision. Am I going to create him in my image? Or the way I realized and discovered, God, you wired him to be creative. You wired him to be intuitive. You wired him to see things I would never see. Thus, the reason you got the video this morning that I ain't getting that. How are you raising your children? In your image or in the way that God has bent them? Now, and let me help you. Your kid don't know they're bent. You're to discover it. That kid knows to be a wild vine going everywhere. <laughs> You've got to discover what that bent is. That's free. I'm sorry. I, 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 I want to deal with marriage today. <laughs> marriage, family, family, family. What an interesting word, family. When, when does family begin? When does the conception of family begin? Family, family, family. Family begins when a man and a woman come to the altar and they say, I do. What do we typically get? When y'all got married, everybody wanted to know, when you going to start family? When you going to start family? When you going to have a baby? Y'all get married. When you going to have a baby? When y'all going to start a family? How many times 
Are you sick of it, Rachel? When y'all gonna have a all your family? Anytime you get around, when y'all gonna start a family? When you gonna start a family? When you gonna say you need to see the look? I said we already did. See, because here's the problem: family begins when a man and a woman come to the altar under the hand of God and they say, "I do." Family does not begin when children are born. Here's the reason why. If family began at the altar, then family revolves around the altar. If family only begins when children are born, family then begins and revolves around the children. And God never created you to revolve around the children. He created you to revolve around him and his purpose. Look at your neighbor and say, mm, that was good. Look back at him and say, I don't like it, but it was good. Our key scripture uses this, this idea that marriage is like a vine. In other words, he's letting us know he's using an analogy but how is the marriage like a vine? Or how is marriage like a vineyard? And today I want to give you four words. And if you'll implement these four words, it'll cause your relationship to begin to get up off the ropes, get back in the middle of the ring for the fight and the ride of your life. These four words are to cultivate, to cling, to climb, and cluster. Cultivate, cling, climb, cluster. The word cultivate means to promote growth with labor, skill, and attention. In other words, you cannot force fruit. You, you just can't do it. You have to create the right environment and circumstances for fruit to be produced. When you consider the analogy of the vine or the vineyard, it takes three years for a vine to be cultivated before it ever produced grapes. Three years before you ever to see results of your labor, results of your work, the growth of all that. It takes three years before you begin to see results. Let me talk to you about marriage because there are some pitfalls, there are some challenges, there are some tough years. Year one is tough. For some, it's harder than others. Year one, you're trying to work out all the selfishness. And you are selfish. I'm selfish. Year three is tough. Year seven is tough. Year 22 through 25, right in there, you're going to have another tough year. And the reason why that one's tough is if you didn't do from year 7 to year 21 right, it makes these years tough because your kids, and you've been revolving everything around them, they moved out when started their own deal, and you're waking up one day going, there's a stranger in my house. And you're like, who's this next to me? I don't even know if I like them anymore. I don't know. What's your name? I don't even know if I know you. Pastor Don, that won't happen to me. Hold your breath, and I'll call you little boy or little girl blue sooner or later. It happens to everybody. Nobody is inoculated from those challenges. Nobody is exempt from them. See, oftentimes when I do a wedding, at the end of the wedding, what I'll do is I'll give, some, I'll give the bride and the groom, I'll give them a seed or I'll give them a little bulb. If, I, if it's tulip season, I'll give them a tulip bulb. And, and I tell them that today you had a marriage or a wedding. And in this wedding, you received the seed of a marriage. And what you plant this marriage and wedding day in will determine the kind of relationship you'll have. 
just like this seed. If you don't worry about the seed, if you forfeit the seed, if you ignore the seed, if you don't do anything with the seed, it'll rot, it'll die, it'll never produce the beauty that it was supposed to. But if you'll take the seed and you'll put it in the right environment, in the right atmosphere, it'll begin to grow, it'll flourish just like your marriage will. It astounds me, Keith, people will spend up to $100,000, $150,000 on a wedding and spend a year preparing and get mad if I'm going to do the wedding and I say, hey, I want to meet with you three times and let's talk about the marriage. Well, I'm just too busy. Doing what? Well, I got to go look at a venue. I got to pick out a dress. I got to sit down with the DJ. I got to make sure the cake is right. All that's important. I want you to have the party of your life. But I would like for the party to last. And I want to give you the skills on how the party can last instead of us jumping from marriage to marriage to marriage or wedding to wedding to wedding and never developing a marriage. Say this with me. I'm working on me. I don't know if you believed it, but it's okay. See, I can't think of the word cultivate without thinking of the word culture. And I didn't want to have five points. I only wanted to have four. So if I had four, you might think there's an ending to this message. But when I think about culture, it begins to cause me to answer the question, what is the culture like in your home, in your marriage? See, culture comes from your values. So what are your values? Because your values in your home, your values in your marriage will determine your culture. I've had women come to me and tell me that I asked them, what's the culture like in your marriage? Oh, we just have honest, we have an honest, open conversation, communication in our relationship. It's just awesome. And I look at him and say, is that true? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> and the reason it's that way is you only have open, honest conversation if there's no fear of retribution for what you're about to say. We want open communication to be a value of our marriage. But most men clam up men. Women, you'll talk to anybody. Good God. You'll sit at a dinner table. Anybody need to go to the party? And five of you will walk off, come back and complain that there was a line at the bathroom. I'm like, you took the line with you. <laughs> You're never going to hear the men I hang out with. Anybody need to go potty? No. <laughs> that ain't happening. You only have an open, honest communication if the man can open his heart, share his heart without fear of retribution. I say this every year. One year, people are going to hear it. Men will open their hearts only about two times in a lifetime of a relationship. Twice. And when they do it, you better understand, I was just given solid gold. And guard it. Protect it. Don't try to understand it. Don't try to dismiss it. Ladies, has your husband ever said, when you asked him, what are you thinking about? And he said, nothing. I know you don't think that's possible. It really is. We can think about nothing. And you're like, that can't be true. It is. <laughs> what are the values? Because your values is what creates the culture of your relationship. Because you are cultivating a culture in your marriage and in your relationship. Let me, let me share some values with you. They're found in Galatians chapter 5. I, I pulled these out of the Passion Translation. I'm not the biggest fan of this translation, but I do like this passage for it. 
But the fruit produced by the Holy Spirit within you is divine love in all its varied expressions. Joy that overflows, peace that subdues, patience that endures, kindness in action, a life full of virtue, faith that prevails, gentleness of heart, and strength of spirit. Never set the law above these qualities, for they are meant to be limitless. Man, those would be some good values to begin to cultivate in our marriages, in our families, in our relationships. Number two, cling, cling. Vines cling so that they can grow. By clinging, it gives the vine staying power. It gives it something to grow on. In relationship, by clinging, it becomes till death do we part. Marriage should have a, a never say die spirit about it. Genesis says, for this purpose, a man shall cling to his wife. It doesn't say anything about the woman because men have got to lead the way. And this is Genesis 2. This is not Genesis 3. That the man has got to lead the way in the clinging because men want to cling to everything else. I love how you shout. You said, but Pastor Don, how do you do that? that it, to find the how, you got to get back to Psalm 127. Verse 1, unless the Lord builds a house, those who labor or those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. We need God's power, not willpower, to cling. And this begins on a reliance upon the Holy Spirit to help build our homes. When, when I was gone, when I was on my trip, I read six books because I read. But I also reread the book of Romans because I felt like the Holy Spirit whispered to me and said, I want you to read Romans again. I said, God, I, Romans? You, you have to understand something about Romans. I have taught Romans word by word, line upon line, Precept upon precept, three different occasions. It takes me a year and a half to teach the book of Romans. And then in doing that, I skip chapters 9, 10, 11 because it pertains to the Jews. It still takes a year and a half. I got Romans on lock. That's why I love people like, I read the Bible. Oh my God, I've read Romans. Read Romans. So I'm reading it. I get to the seventh chapter, the familiar chapter to everybody who fails, falls, and see, tries to get back up. Begins somewhere 7, verse 14, 15, somewhere in there. It begins to say this. The things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. And the things I want to do, I just can't find myself to do it. Who will deliver me from this wretched man that I am? And then we get into Chapter 18, I mean, chapter 8, verse 1. There is now, therefore, now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. And we're like, ah. love that no condemnation stuff. Free. And I'm reading it after teaching it three different times. I've read Romans a hundred plus times. I miss the main point. My God, I'm an idiot. How can I read this and miss the whole thing all these years? Romans chapter 7, not one time, not once, does it mention the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8 mentions the Holy Spirit over 20 times. What Paul is saying, you want to know how? to stop doing what you don't want to do and start doing what you do want to do, you need the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, li now listen to me. I ain't talking about the speaking in tongues stuff. The speaking in tongues is a gift. You need the person of the Holy Spirit operating in your life where you're like, Holy Spirit, I want to know you. I want a relationship with you. I've always thought 
when I think about the Holy Spirit, and we talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit, I've always used the analogy of like a bottle. And then somehow, like this bottle, the Holy Spirit just gets all drunk up and wore up. The Holy Spirit just gets leaked out through my day. I'm just losing the Holy Ghost. I need a fresh fin filling of the Holy Spirit, Lord. This carpet's been wetter than that. Don't get nervous. <laughs> We've baptized a thousand people over here, <laughs> literally. And I'm like, I'm leaking, I'm leaking, I'm leaking. I need more of the Holy Spirit. Oh, God! I'm reading Romans 8. And the Holy Spirit speaks to me and says, Stop viewing me in a bottle leaking out. He said, I can't be put in a bottle. I said, then what is my proper visual? I got to have a picture. He said, oh, that's easy. I'm wind, and you have to put up the sails. And when you put up the sails, they get filled with the wind, and they propel you in the direction that the sails are set. We got folks that speak in tongues but aren't filled with the Spirit. And I can tell because the way our sails are set. That is good. Thank you. <laughs> and we're struggling in our relationship. We're struggling in our marriages. We're struggling with our families. And we're like, God, I, I, I need to do this. I need to do it. No, 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 no. You just need to say, Holy Spirit, I got, you got to help me. Pastor, how often do, how do I do that every day? When you get up in the morning, Holy Spirit, I need your help today. Holy Spirit, I need your help in my marriage. I need your help in my life. First time I ever saw that. Isn't that crazy? Read and study all those years and miss it. But we need the Holy Spirit. Now, Psalm 128 says the Lord will bless you out of Zion. See, when we begin to see marriage from God's perspective, not from this world's point of view, we begin to see that Man, marriage can be so much different than what I thought it could be. Harvard University did a study under the name Human Flourishing. This is Harvard. This isn't a Christian school. This isn't a Bible college. This is Harvard University under the study entitled Human Flourishing. And the study revealed this. Divorce rates go down by 35 to 50% if those couples, listen, are actively involved in a local church. The study gave many dismissive reasons why they think these results have surfaced. But they did have to admit, in quotes, when people see themselves as the church, not just being religious, they find these kind of results in their relationships. In other words, you can't just come to church and hope to have a good marriage. You have to become the church if you're going to have a relationship like God wants because God doesn't dwell in this building. He dwells in us. See, we have to cultivate our marriage. Then we have to clean. Why? So that we can climb. I love this vine behind us. I, I was in England five years ago, and I went to Surrey, England here just for the purpose of seeing this vine because I'm weird. This is the largest grapevine in the world as well as the oldest. It's over 2,000 years old. The trunk of this vine is 13 feet around. It has branches that run over 100 feet. And if you talk to the curators, they say the only reason it can do that is because we've given it something sturdy and stable to run on. If you want to be strong, you better have something to run on. If you want to have a strong marriage, you better have something to run on, something to grow, some way to climb. 
No, notice the picture. The vine is, is this large and healthy because it has something to, to climb on. Marriage is one of God's tools to help you and I grow personally and help us climb together. You and your spouse are to be climbing companions, growing individually, growing together. And at the end of this message, I'm going to give you some very easy practicals that will help you begin to do that. A grapevine that doesn't have something to grow on, the grapevine still grows. And I can take you to some places where you can see them, but they're just kind of like a mush plant. And the grapes that are there are few and far between, and they're not full of grapes. They're not flourishing. Look at all the fat, juicy grapes that are on this thing. Good Lord. Isn't that crazy? Why? Because it had something to grow on, and it's not just a blob. My prayer is that our relationships, our marriages are more than blobs, but we got something that we're running on. We're about purpose. We're not just about ourselves. Most noted and abused passage of Scripture in all the Bible when it comes to marriage and relationships is Ephesians 5. And Paul really isn't even talking about marriage. He's using marriage as an analogy about the way God, about Jesus, and how he thinks about the church. If we've taken it and built all this abuse around the thing, which drives me nuts because we're trying to get back to a Genesis 2 and a Psalm 128 deal and and because of it, this passage has been used to, especially in religious circles, to hurt instead of to help. But using it within the context of marriage, you have to understand it doesn't begin in verse 21. It begins in verse 15 of Ephesians chapter 5. And it says, act like people. I, and I, I had to take this out of the CEV version because it just, it's good. It really is. You, you'll get it. Act like people with good sense and not like fools. Isn't that good? These are evil times. So make every minute count. Don't be stupid. I mean, I think I might have wrote this. <laughs> this is the redneck translation. Praise God. Instead, find out what the Lord wants you to do. Don't destroy yourself by getting drunk. But let the Spirit fill your life. Verse 21, honor Christ and put others first. A wife should put her husband first, as she does the Lord. A husband should love his wife as much as Christ loved the church, gave his life for it. In the same way, a husband should love his wife as much as he loves himself. There'd be a lot of loving going on. A husband who loves his wife shows that he loves himself. See, the King James, the New King James, the NIV, the ESV, several other translations, they use the word submit and submission, which has been abused. But it becomes easy to submit. It becomes easy to get under submission and in submission. We understand that submission is both the man and the woman submitting to a mission larger than themselves. But whenever submission is authoritative and it only serves one person or individual, nobody wants to do that. That's abusive. But when the husband and the wife get a vision for their relationship that comes from God and a purpose and a mission that comes from God, it becomes easy to get up under that thing together, side by side, submitted to one another under the vision that God had for the very reason that we said, I do. God, I'm just trying to do God's way. You can keep doing what you're doing. I, it's no sweat off my nose. Brent does the counseling. <laughs> but see, this gives purpose to the cultivating. It gives purpose to the clinging and the climbing. Why? Because then we get to produce clusters. 
before you think that fruit is just about kids, it's not. When he says, I want you to multiply and be fruitful and multiply, he's not talking about us just running around having a bunch of kids. He's talking about us having influence. He's talking about us being image bearers and taking the image of God and the image of Christ everywhere we go. Whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you have kids or you don't have kids, you should be a living, moving, breathing, walking upper room everywhere you go. Interesting, though, even this vine is pretty interesting. It only bears fruit 100 to 150 days out of the year, and that is only if all the conditions and the climate is correct. Say, so, Pastor Don, why do you tell us that? Because your marriage isn't always going to be producing grapes. Sometimes it's growing. Sometimes your marriage is going through a pruning season. When, when I was studying for this and I began to, to look at it, I began to understand and, and learn that, that these vines, whenever you look at a vineyard, the vineyard is separated in blocks and in seasons. Seasons when it's harvested and blocks when it's been planted. And so a vine dresser looks out across his vineyard and he knows that everything here is based on seasons and blocks. And it's different according to seasons and blocks. Your marriage has seasons and it has blocks. It has seasons when you're blessed and everything's going well. And it has, um, it's just not. Your marriage is in a pruning season, and God's using your wife to prune you, and God's using your husband to prune you. They went all my laughter out the window. <laughs> you know, in, in, in church circles, Christian circles, man, we talk about the waves of God, especially in a Pentecostal charismatic church. I, I, and I love that. Don't get me wrong. I'm all about it, man. you got the waves of his glory, waves of his presence, waves of his spirit, waves of, wow, do you feel the waves of God? But when I'm in Scotland, well, actually when anywhere I'm over in Europe, that part of the world, what fascinates me is tides. The tides are so extreme that when they go out, you can have anywhere from 100 yards to 300 yards of dry ground. And when the tide shifts and comes back in, what was once dry is now wet and deep underwater. In Liverpool, England, there are these nine-foot soldiers that are underwater everywhere out there. They're nine foot tall. And they're just sitting in the water. And then when the tide is in, you can't see them. But when the tide is out, there's an army standing everywhere of these statuaries of soldiers. You can Google it. I know you will. See, that can't be true. Go ahead. It's fine. And as I was thinking, I, I, I'm, I'm hanging around St. Andrews, and I'm like, man. Matter of fact, I'm at King's Barn. I'm walking. I'm like, Phew. I tell the caddy, I'm like, It stinks. He goes, yeah, tide's out. I said, tide's out, it stinks? He goes, yeah. He said, tide goes out and fish. I don't know why, but they get left on dry ground. They die. Look at all the birds out there eating them. I'm like, y'all get this every day? He goes, no, we get this twice a day. I'm like, oh, my word. He said, but tide will come in and wash it all away, so it'll be okay. And so we're walking, and he's wanting to talk about golf. I'm, I'm building a sermon. <laughs> I'm like, nobody ever talks about the tide of relationship. Hey, let's think about fish. You know how long tides have been happening? And God said, let us separate the water from the dry ground and dry ground from the water. From that point forward, tides started working. Fish are to know. Tides going out. Let's go for a swim. But they get caught on dry ground. Tide of your relationship will come in. It will go out. 
Don't throw away the relationship when the tide's out. Well, it's dry. Our conversation, a tide will change. It'll come back. It'll flourish again. Let me give you some practical helps. Be okay? At least I want to give you some practical helps. Hopefully it will. The other thing you have to know about the cluster of grapes is, and I, and I learned this, you only make grapes, one, to sell grapes or to create wine. Wine in the Word of God always speaks of anointing, but it's a whole series. It's not a message, it's a series, and I don't have time to get into it. But here's the thing I learned in studying for the message. For, to make a bottle of wine, which I don't drink wine, I've never drank wine, but to, to make a bottle of wine, it takes 1,402 grapes to make one bottle of wine. Who counted all of that to make one bottle of wine? I don't know. I don't know. But the wine cannot be made unless the grape is crushed. So sometimes what you have created in your life has got to be crushed because you don't know what its desired outcome really was supposed to be. So all the pain you've been through, all the hurt you've been through, all the, the tragedy your relationship has been through, all the heartache you've walked through, and you wonder, God, how have I survived? It's because he was making a wine. You thought it was all about the clusters. But he all along had something more in mind for your marriage, for your life, for your family. That the heartache, the hurt, it wasn't in vain. It was to produce something that was of greater value. Do you know what you sell those grapes for? And then do you know what you sell the wine those grapes make? Boom. Homework, Google it. Dang, that's another reason I can't drink. I can't afford that. <laughs> So everything your marriage has been through, my question is, are you going to allow God to allow it to produce what he intended? Or are we just going to be upset? We're going to be angry. We're going to be bitter because I had to go through the crushing of what I cultivated, what I grew. Let me give some practical helps. Is this Okay. Is this all right? I, I just want to help you. It'd be easy for me to come in here and inspire you, preach like I've lost my ever-loving mind, and talk about sheep. Oh, I got a message on sheep. It's coming. I learned something. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I want to help you. One of the biggest illusions of our time is that love is self-sustaining. Love is not self-sustaining. You've got to sustain it. You've got to begin to put into it. You've got to pour into it. Every year we make resolutions. We create personal growth plans. We set goals. I mean, I, anybody here ever had a New Year's resolution? Anybody ever made a personal growth plan? My God, what's wrong with you people? Lord, I have failed. But have you ever done that with your marriage? Have you ever done that in your relationship? That, you know what, this year, as a marriage, as a couple, we're going to create a personal growth plan. We're going to set some goals together as a couple. We're going to be intentional about some resolutions Maybe some, some new habits that we do together. John and I do this on our anniversary. Sounds painful, doesn't it? I heard the, I, I heard the air just leave the building. <gasps> but you create a personal growth plan for your marriage. You set goals for your relationship. You establish and view your habits so here's what you do. Here's a rough plan. Take out a big cheap tablet and crayon. Here we go. 
Every six months or so, take a mini vacation. I say a mini vacation, two to three days, just you. Leave the kids at home. Pastor Don, I don't have a sitter. Find one. Take them to an in-law. You don't want them to be 18, 19 years old, move out, and you don't even know the person you've been living with. But just you as a couple. If you can't do it every six months, do it at least once a year. Just you as a couple. Bounce. Every six months, review your spending and saving habits. <laughs> Everybody just winced again. Because <laughs> here, here's the reason why. The number two cause of divorce in America is finances. Number two cause. Every six months, check in with each other on your social media views, watches, look at, habits. Number one cause of divorce in America, social media. Every six months, compare perspectives dreams, hopes, and fears. Ask the question, what are you dreaming about? What are your hopes? What do you fear? It changes the older you get. When you're a man and you're 25 years old, you don't fear jack squat. Nothing. You're impervious. When you're a man and you're 55 years old, it's amazing the fears that have creeped in over the last few years. Your fears change. Your dreams change. Your hopes change. But does your spouse know that? I know this ain't spiritual. I, I should just... Every six months or so, agree to try something new. Try something new. Our Iceland trip was Jonna's expression to, hey, let's try something new. Let's go on adventure. Let's hike. Let's go see waterfalls. 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 Waterfall. After a while, I'm like, don't go chasing waterfalls. <laughs> I'm like, I get it now. I never understood the song. Now I did. I'm like, babe, what are we doing today? Well, we're going to go see a waterfall. Well, didn't we see one yesterday? This one's different. Okay. And for her, you can't see a waterfall at the bottom of the mountain. You get a better view if you hike that rascal. Why? We're going where? It's an adventure. Remember, we're trying something new. Whew. I average walking eight miles a day on this vacation. I need a vacation for my vacation. I don't do that when I'm working out, Jacob. Eight miles a day. And then my phone would tell me, you climbed this many stairs. Those were not stairs. <laughs> and then after we're chasing waterfalls and puffins. Oh, they are awesome. Great sermon in puffins. <laughs> and all these things, John is like, you want to go see a volcano? I'm like, no. We'll save that for the next time we want to try something new. I can see it. 50 miles away, <laughs> and you could, <laughs> but try something new, your relationships. Once a month, spend the day together. Once a month, spend a day by yourself. <laughs> Once a month, give each other a gift. It doesn't have to be expensive. Doesn't even have to be tangible. Once a month, visit with friends. I, I, I watch 
young adults, y'all make me nervous because you build all these play days for your kids. I hope you're building relationships with these people because one day there's going to be no kids to have play days and are you still going to have relationships with these kids? Parents. Your, your friends should not be new to you. It should be people that have been in your life for a while. Once a week, eat a meal together. Once a week, take a walk. Once a week, enjoy an activity together. Once a week, attend church or small group together. Once a week, take a break from technology. Put away the computer, the TV, the phone, the social media. Oh, my God. Once a week, share a special snack together. Whatever that is that you like. Popcorn, ice cream, chocolate, blizzards. I promise you, if you'll cultivate, clean, and climb, you'll produce clusters of a fruitful relationship. Your marriage and relationship will find itself in the middle of the ring instead of against the ropes. It really will. I wish I could throw all enough all on you to fix your relationships. I wish I could baptize you enough times that you finally come out holy and your marriage be fixed. But there ain't enough oil in Saudi Arabia, and there's not enough water in the Pacific Ocean. You're going to have to get to work. And you're going to have to say, God, I need your help. I can't do it without you. Because when I try to do relationship, marriage, family, without the Holy Spirit, I find myself doing what I don't want to do and the things I want to do I don't find myself doing that. But I know by the Holy Spirit of God, I can do it. Here's what I want. I want to pray for us this morning. When I get through praying, Sarah's going to just step up and make you aware of a couple announcements going on, give you an opportunity to give, tithe, and kingdom builders. But if you're married, engaged, or hope to be married one day. Because some folks, they're single, they don't want to be married. I, you're good. But if you're married today or engaged or you want to be married, I want you to stand to your feet. Because I, I want to pray for you. I, I just want to pray God's blessing over your life. Yesterday, I'm in the hospital, and Corey asked, who wants to hold Callan first? And I said, I do. And John looked at me, and I'm like, you got your two. I'm holding this one first. And when I held him, I couldn't help but think of legacy. I was doing everything I could not just to burst out the ugly tears. The tears were rolling down my face. And all I could think about was all the times I didn't quit when I wanted to. All the times I didn't throw in the towel when I wanted to. You're the pastor. You should never have those thoughts. So, put my shoes and pants on just like you do. Matter of fact, the devil attacks me harder than he does you. I promise you. Just read your Bible. It'll tell you. And I thought, legacy. God is worth. It's funny, Joy wouldn't have anything to do with me as long as I hold him. She ignored me, a little stinker. 
right next to me, looking out the window, ignoring me. I said, Joy, you want to know a secret? And anytime I tell Joy, you want to know a secret, she leans her ear into me. She don't even look at me. I say, you're still my favorite. She made me a pop-pop. She smiled real big. Looked back out the window. Man. Father, I thank you for every individual here today. I thank you for your hand upon their life, upon their relationships, upon their marriages, upon their families. God, I ask you today, I don't know their fight. I don't know their challenge. I don't know what has pushed them up against the ropes. I don't know the Tysons that seem to be knocking them from side to side. And I don't know the eight counts they have found themselves under. But I do know your desires for them to get back up. Go again. Try again. Keep moving forward. Keep climbing. Keep clinging. Keep cultivating. Keep producing. Father, I pray your blessing upon every relationship, upon every family, upon every marriage, every person that desires to be married. God, I pray that they will stop looking for Mr. or Mrs. Wright and they would just simply become Mr. and Mrs. Wright for somebody else. God, it's amazing that when we get ourselves right, you bring the right people into our lives. Father, I pray your blessing over every individual here. Strengthen their relationships. Strengthen their family. Strengthen their marriages. And I ask you to do it in Jesus' wonderful name. Let everybody say amen.